Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church, and thank you so much for being with us here today as we worship. Today we do have our church council meeting immediately following the service, so if you are a church council member, just keep that in mind. Also, we want to remind you, this is your final warning. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, so if you haven't prepared for that, now is the time. And we are going to have a beautiful Mother's Day service, so we want to invite uh, all of the women to come and make sure you join us. Invite your mothers, your daughters, your sisters, all of the special women in your life. Also, we want to remind you that we do have a vacation Bible school power session coming up on Sunday, May 21st. So we are going to get hyped up for Vacation Bible School at this session. We're going to learn about how Vacation Bible School is going to run, um, get some ideas, 
uh, get some inspiration, and also eat some delicious lunch. So we are going to provide lunch for all of our volunteers. So make sure that you write that on your calendars and just keep that in mind. We'll meet immediately following the service uh, back in the fellowship room back here. Also, we want to let you know that our Annie Armstrong Easter offering has officially ended. Uh, and we ended it on a spectacular note. The total amount of offering that we collected was $915. So just shy of a thousand. That was awesome. That was, that is an amazing amount and we should be proud that all $915 of that is going to go to the mission field to help further the kingdom. Also, we want you to keep in mind that we could still use some button-up shirts to, for painting smocks for the children for Vacation Bible School. So if you have any old button-up shirts that you can part with, bring those up here. We'll take them. And also, we need to borrow some sweaters and coats just for a little lesson uh, for the kids just to kind of put on for um, an object lesson. So if you have any, just bring them up here and we will take good care of those and make sure we return them to you. Or if you have any that you don't need anymore and you just want to donate, that's fine also. We would greatly appreciate that. And now we are going to turn this service back over to Brother Bill and the praise team because he has some beautiful things prepared for this service today. And also uh, Brother Oscar is going to conclude uh, this wonderful series that he has been preaching on today. And we'll have our Mother's Day sermon next Sunday. Thank you, Becky. If you are able to stand, let us stand. The song says, we praise you, O God, our Redeemer. You, Lord, our Father. From ancient times, your name is our Redeemer. <laughs> Our scripture I'm reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, the 17th chapter and verse 10. Would you read with me, please? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. You may be seated. Lord, you are the judge of the earth. Justice is yours, and you will bring it to pass, not necessarily in this life, but in eternity. Lord, you know our every thought, our every word, our every deed. You know our motives. 
and you keep an accurate record. Lord, we also appreciate the fact that you are gracious and merciful. And if we turn to you humbly and admit to our sin, you will be just and faithful to forgive us and bring us back into fellowship with you and to not give us the punishment we deserve. For we are broken, fallen people and we do evil. Yet, Lord, you forgive us. Thank you for that. We look forward to seeing a kingdom here on earth where you dwell as King of kings and Lord of lords in peace and justice and righteousness that we would see what that is like. Until then, have us to work for you to proclaim your peace and mercy and justice and your forgiveness in your holy name. Amen.
As we go into the stewardship portion of our service, our thought comes out of Proverbs 38 to 9, and it, it starts off, keep falsehood and lies from me, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you. And so what, what we're seeing here is that our lifestyle should be characterized by management. In other words, we need to balance uh, what we have against what we don't. We, we need to understand that God gives us exactly what we need. And so he provides for us. And this is what we have to understand in our lives, that as we manage this, so we must manage um, uh, giving because uh, we accumulate things, but we should also understand that we need to give to God in proportion. And so that is what stewardship is about, seeing what God has given us and giving uh, proportionately back to let him know that we understand everything we have came from him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can recognize that you are the great provider. And it is through you we have what we need. Now, we, we may not have a lot that we want, but you have provided and you have provided well, and we thank you, Lord, that we can come and worship you and recognize that you are someone we can depend on, and it's through your love and grace that we are here today. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
some uh, notes off the podium here, or I'll be preaching Alice's song <laughs> instead of my message. <laughs> but as we uh, gather here today, we are wrapping up our, our series on idolatry. Now, it's, it's been an interesting uh, three weeks, and we've talked about exposing that golden calf in our lives by looking at um, various surface and root idols that seem to pop up. Then we um, looked at uh, specific areas of idolatry that commonly affect us. We, we talked about the family and, and uh, issues that can happen there. And last week we talked about money. So it's, it's uh, just, a, a, just a myriad of idols that can take our minds off of Jesus. And so as this series uh, comes to a close, we're going to look at one final idol that can be incredibly pervasive because it's woven into the fabric of our culture. It manifests its, um, uh, itself under different names like power, success, achievement. And so with this in mind, uh, I want to start by showing you a photo of a man you've probably never heard of. Okay, this, this man is Nathan Hatch. Now in the world of education, he's pretty successful. He was the leading historian of religion in the United States before becoming provost of Notre Dame. He left that position to serve as president of Wake Forest University in North Carolina in 2020. And not only was he president of Wake Forest, 
He was also on the board of the American Higher Education. He was a board member of the NCAA and was a vice chairman of the Council of Independent Colleges. Now, the Council of Independent Colleges consists of about 600 colleges and universities nationwide. It, uh, overall, it represents over a million students. Now, I don't uh, uh, blame you if you're wondering, you know, why is, is he showing us a photo of some random guy and giving us his resume? Well, you can wonder that all you like because I'm going to tell you. You know, when a man with this level of experience and reputation talks about higher education, people listen. They take note because he knows about what he is talking. In 2009, and you can go to Wake Forest's website and read this, Nathan Hatch gave a keynote address to uh, 600 college presidents at the Council of Independent Colleges titled, Renewing the Wellsprings of Responsibility. Now this keynote address began with what educators had already observed regarding trends dating back over the past 20 or 30 years. And this is what was observed. Across these 600 colleges, there is a disproportionate number of students enrolling in just a few specific majors. These majors include corporate and investment finance, banking, corporate law and business consulting, and specialized medicine. Now this was interesting to Mr. Hatch because he realized that there's way more students that are signing up for these majors than would statistically have a talent or natural skill toward that particular study. Now, it's not uh, necessarily rocket science to figure out why so many students were funneling into these careers. They make money, you know. They make a lot of money. But further, they serve as the benchmarks of success and status in our culture. Now, Nathan Hatch doesn't simply look at this and say, look at the drive and ambition of our young people. Look at how many are shooting for the highest levels of success. Look at how many are shooting for the stars. No, instead, in this keynote, he said, young people have been defining success and choosing careers with less attention to the larger question of meaning and purpose. The stratospheric salaries in investment banking, in consulting, in uh, premier law firms, and in specialized sectors of medicine have bedazzled a whole generation of our best students. Yet, despite their financial success, there are signs of acute frustration by many young professionals. Often, their work does not satisfy or sustain. And he continues talking about career burnout, saying that the people in these highly uh, prestigious and competitive careers are looking at total burnout. And this is due to people flooding into these life choices and careers, not because of a calling, but because they're just success struck. Now, the question that I think naturally arises is why? You know, there's no way that this 
has just happened out of the blue. You know, just come on from nowhere. This success struck pursuit that embodies our culture today had to start somewhere. And this is what he says about it. This culture of achievement can be all pervasive. The quiet revolution in the way Americans are raising their children is the professionalization of childhood. Even grade school children are pushed into a culture of competition with great attention given to which school they should attend, what grades they should achieve, and how many activities they should pursue. The message is loud and clear. Identity at any age is formed by what we do and what we accomplished. Now, while there may be bits and pieces there that, that you might disagree with, since every single American in, uh, uh, family doesn't operate in the way that he describes, there is something profound in the phrase, identity at any age is formed by what we do and accomplish. You know, think about parents of young children. You know, the ones that say, is your child walking yet? And you'll reply, ha, ah, walking? He's already talking. You know, this, this results in potential danger. The danger is a generation of people making life decisions out of a worldly desire than out of their own talent, gift, or passion. And the problem with this is the danger of exchanging one king for another. You know, did you know that we were built to bow? You know, we need, we have an innate need to find someone or something to serve. And the problem with this is um, uh, it's, it's uh, a time when, when we need to be careful. Because think about it. In, in high school, you get a letter jacket for playing a sport or, or being involved in an extracurricular activity. Every year, you work hard to add pins and patches to your jacket, and, and it just shows everyone who glances at you what you had achieved. You know, maybe you were in the Girl or Boy Scouts and had that vest wrapped with badges. You know, maybe, maybe it's trophies on a shelf. Maybe it's report cards or a diploma or how many degrees you have. Maybe it's the promotion or the raises, the, the job title to which you unknowingly bow to. And while these things are fairly obvious, the idol of success is sneaky. You know, think about that. It's sneaky because it's usually gift wrapped in virtuous traits and good values. Maybe it's a kitchen or a home that's perfectly clean. Maybe it's a lawn that's perfectly manicured, you know, where, where you go out and cut it in opposing semicircles every four days throughout the mowing season. You know, like, like I say, the, the, the idol of success is sneaky. In fact, it may be the sneakiest of any of the idols that we've talked about during this series because these can all be acts of worship. All of these actions should be things that we should do with the thought of glorifying God for recognizing him for the talents and the gifts that we've been given and for using our talents for his kingdom. But when we start making our lives about getting things done, 
when our identity is in our achievements, we don't necessarily move God off the throne. But let me tell you, we make him have to fight for space in the room. So today, we're going to look in the book of Luke. So if you want to turn to Luke 10, verses 38 to 42, it's at, it's at this point in Luke that Jesus only has about six months left on earth. You know, there, he doesn't have much time left, and he knows it. Now, I think it's safe to say that as far as achievers go, Jesus is pretty high on the list. You know, after all, it only took him a few short years to redeem all humanity. So in this story or, or in this passage, it's a bit of surprise that we see him taking time to visit with some friends of his, you know, Mary and Martha. Now, in my wisdom, if I knew everything that was going to transpire I think I would have suggested to Jesus, you know, you need to skip visiting these two. You know, there's things you really need to do. I would have told him that, that you know, there's, there's a lot of important stuff that needs to be accomplished. You only have six months left, you know, but we still do that today. You know, when the disciples thought Jesus didn't have time uh, to be uh, uh, talking to children. He had a busy itinerary. Jesus tells them in Matthew 19, 14, let the little children come to me. You know, as with the children, he is also intentional about spending time now with these two women and you, you have to understand that they do have a special relationship with him because they're the two sisters of Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead. And Luke 10, 38 says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, Here's the scene that was taking place at that time. One woman is hurrying around frantically dealing with all the preparations. Her desire is that the home needs to be perfect and worthy of Jesus. While the other is just sitting quietly at his feet, listening to what he has to say. Luke 10, 40 to 42. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but Few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You know, there's, there, in this passage, in these two verses, there's a lot going on. This section alone could easily be a sermon or two in itself, but we're looking at these Verses through the lens of idolatry. As such, there are two important phrases that I want to make sure you don't miss. The first one, Martha was distracted. And the second, Mary has chosen. Martha had great intentions. You know, it's, it's not bad to desire to present our best to God, you know, right? You know, but, but how often do we live our lives with good intentions like Martha 
instead of spending time with Jesus like Mary. When we fill our lives with good intentions, we find at the end of the day, there's one thing on our checklist that we didn't get to do. And that is to spend time with Jesus. Wrestling with this idol of success and achievement is a daily battle. And here's why. This idol offers a method of measurement. You know, how much easier is it to give the vast majority our, of our time to something that we can tangibly see? When the kitchen gets clean, guess what? I can see it's clean. You know, it was dirty, now it's clean. If there's a pile of laundry that needs to be washed and I wash it, guess what? It's clean. That's tangible. I can touch it. I can see it. When the grass gets mowed or when the car gets washed, these are things that give us instant gratification. As soon as they're done, they're done. We can see that, and it's awesome, you know. So now we can move on to the next thing, you know. How many times do you pray for something? You spend time in God's Word, then you spend time in prayer with Jesus, and you pray and pray and pray and pray and pray, and, pray and then you don't see any immediate results. When we pray, we want to see the results for what we've been praying. A family, you know, like a family member sick, now they're well. A neighbor needs to come to Christ, suddenly they show up in church. This is what we want to see. The tyranny of the urgent is when we allow ourselves to be distracted in a sea of things, like this needs to be done right this second. And this breeds a subconscious mindset which says, because we have a list of things that we deem to be done right now, then that means that when we ask God for something, he too should do them right this second. You know, our time, not his. Our will, not his. In other words, God needs to have faith in us, not the other way around. See how sneaky yet dangerous this idol is? It's wrapped in good, virtuous intentions. But when we lose sight of the main thing, everything else gets turned inside out and backwards. The thing about God you have to understand is he's never early and he's never late. You know, this, this can be so hard to grasp in the middle of fervent prayer, but it should also be comforting too. What Martha was doing wasn't evil, cleaning the house, getting things straight. She wasn't doing a bad thing. In fact, I'd even say that what she was doing was a good thing. She was, in reality, serving Jesus. She wanted her house to be as the best it could be for, literally, Jesus. But Jesus said, Mary was doing what she was doing was better. And there's a lesson to be learned here. We can be doing something good, but it could be bad when there's something better. Martha was busy and distracted by preparing the house for Jesus when he, you know, literally walked through the door. 
Martha was cleaning the house for Jesus when Jesus literally was in her home. She's distracted. And yet, how many of us do the same thing? How often are we distracted with all the things that we need to do that we just don't have time to talk with Jesus? Now, I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of trying to do X, Y, and Z, and then when I go to bed, I realize, you know, maybe I should have spent more time in God's Word. Maybe I should have spent more time in prayer. So as, as this is the last message in this series, it's time that we tackle what all of these idols come down to. And it's one word. That word is choice. These idols don't lure us with something that's overtly or obviously uh, sinful. Rather, these gods battle for our hearts with distractions of good things. Distractions of good things made ultimate in our lives. Distractions of things that could be acts of worship. And the answer comes down to one phrase, reordering our priorities. Throughout scripture, we hear about choices. You know, we, we, we hear about it from Moses and Joshua and Elijah and, and, even, and, and now Jesus. And in this passage, Jesus commended Mary for the choice that she made. Now, there's another trait that Martha demonstrates, another symptom of someone who struggles with an idol of success or achievement, and that's comparison. She compares herself to Mary. In other words, she keeps score. Luke 10, 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Teddy Roosevelt said this about comparison. He said, comparison is the theft thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. In terms of idolatry, there are two main symptoms of having an idol of success or achievement. The first symptom is that you have a constant frustration with people in your life who, from your perspective, aren't getting it done. Um, or if, if you really want to be honest about it, they aren't getting it done your way. Now, Martha wanted Mary to be a better teammate. And Mary didn't even realize there was a game in progress. You know, this symptom often manifests itself in undeserved criticism. Martha is highly critical of Mary's lack of help. Mary's is busy listening to Jesus. Different priorities, undeserved criticism. Sometimes... Constructive criticism is deserved and, and necessary. I, I know that. But other times, maybe a difference in perspective would also yield a different result. And the second symptom of this idol of success or achievement is being discontent. Discontent with yourself, discontent with your life, discontent with the results of, of putting hope in your future or, you know, on the achievements of your past. Thomas DeLong, a professor at Harvard Business School, in an article discussing high achievement uh, individuals, put it like this. When only external factors become our metrics for success, we are setting ourselves up for misery. You know, do you feel like you compare yourself to others constantly? You know, 
I'm doing so much more than so-and-so. Why, why don't they help? Or maybe you think, I should have gone into medicine. You know, so-and-so over there is a doctor and he's driving a Mercedes. You know, all of so-and-so's posts on social media seem so happy. Why can't I be happy like that? Let me tell you, that person is miserable over there on social media. They're just doing that to make you feel bad. You know, does, does it feel like you're living your life always running to catch up? Maybe you focus too much on getting things done or getting things done right, that it becomes more important than anything or anyone else. One of my favorite verses is Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, most of the time, we have that verse, and it's up there to be memorized. You know, that, you know, we, we don't even read the, the amazing or sometimes terrifying next verse, Jeremiah 17:10. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. You know, the heart's deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? God can, because I know I sure can't. Timothy Keller puts it like this. You are more sinful than you ever thought you were. And you are more loved than you ever dreamed you could be. Achieving great things is amazing. You know, it's, it's wonderful until it replaces Jesus on the throne. Yet achieving great and wonderful things can make this world a better place. But in the end, we can't put our faith in what we personally achieve. We can't uh, put our faith in merits and achievement because they are not eternal. Only Christ is. 2 Corinthians 4.18 so we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, I, I thank God that his grace and mercy is available. Not because we may be a great student or have great grades and all sorts of patches or pins, not because we've raised the best children or because we have the esteem of, of everyone in, in cubicle land, but because it's grace. It's a gift. If my sense of identity or value isn't based on what I do or what I've achieved, but what has already been done for me through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, if that's my starting point, that changes everything. And again, I'm, I'm telling you, work is not bad. Our achievements are not bad. But imagine if you had a gospel-centered approach to what you do to your actions, to your work, to your responsibilities. You could go about a day without making comparisons. You would no longer put yourself in the position of proving your worth to others. Clarence Jordan was a man of uh, unusual abilities and commitment. He had two PhDs, one in agriculture and the other in Greek and Hebrew. So he was gifted. He could have done anything he wanted. But you know what he did? He chose to serve the poor. In the 1940s, he founded 
a farm in Americus, Georgia, and he called it Koinonia Farm. It was a, a community for poor whites and poor blacks. And as you can surmise, uh, this idea really didn't go well in the deep south of the 40s. The townspeople had tried everything to get rid of him. They tried boycotting him. They, tried, they, they slashed the tires on the workers' trucks when they came to town. Over and over again for 14 years, they tried to stop him. And finally, in 1954, the Ku Klux Klan had enough of him. So they decided to get rid of him once and for all. They came one night with guns and torches, set fire to every building on the farm except his home, which they just riddled with bullets. They chased off all the families except for one black family that refused to leave. Now Clarence recognized the voice of the Klansmen, some of whom were church members. One Klansman was a local newspaper reporter because the next day the reporter came out to see what remained of the farm. The rubble was smoldering, but he found Clarence in the field, hoeing and planting. The reporter says, uh, I heard the awful news and I came to do a story of your farm closing. And Clarence just kept hoeing and planting the reporter kept poking, trying to get this quietly determined man to get angry. Instead of packing, Clarence was planning. Finally, the, record, the reporter uh, said in a haughty voice, well, Dr. Jordan, you've got two of them PhDs and you've got 14 years into this farm and there's nothing left of it at all. Just how successful do you think you've been? Well, Clarence stopped towing, turned toward the reporter with his penetrating blue eyes and said quietly, but firmly, about as successful as the cross. Now, sir, I don't think you understand us. What we are about is not success, but faithfulness. We're staying. Good day. Yeah. Beginning that day, Clarence and his companions rebuilt the farm. It's still going today. Chuck Colson, he was a highly successful man, but he was sent to prison as a result of the Watergate scandal, you know. And he was saved while he was incarcerated. And he said this about coming to Christ. God doesn't want our success. He wants us. You know, our existence doesn't have to be justified by our accomplishments. Our significance, our value has already been proven and paid for by Jesus. God gave his one and only son so that we might have eternal life, so that we can have the life that he paid for, free of charge. Thank God that through Christ, we can be, like Clarence said, as successful as the cross. You know, what a wonderful response to a world that tried to tear him down. He's a perfect example of priorities being reordered. He not only destroyed that idol of success, but the idols of money and family and control, approval, power, and comfort. This is what we need to do. This is why we have to be so concerned about things that, that start creeping into our lives that take us over before we even know it. And this is why that God so loved the world, 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today recognizing that yes, we, we do have idols in our lives, some that we haven't recognized yet and, and some that are so obvious. And we just ask you today to help us reorder our priorities, to, to make the right choices, to choose to be with you. And as we go through life, we pray that we can teach others about how valuable it is to spend time with you rather than to spend time with things. And we ask that you continue to watch over us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.